we're in business. Um, I was tempted actually to let mine run well over um, 6.30 so you can ask me any difficult questions or indeed any other speakers. But in the event, I will attempt to whip through the wonderful world of ecosystem services and natural capital accounting as quickly as I can. Um, my name is Vince Hollio. I head the Rural and Environmental Advice Team within Government Advice, which is part of Historic England, or Historic Engla, as it says on the slide in front of me. Um, and I wanted to talk to you today about ecosystem services and natural capital accounting and the work that Historic England has been doing on both of them um, over the past few years um, and our direction of travel. Um, the Millennium Ecosystems Assessment um, is something that relates back to the United Nations. It was instigated in 2001 and the idea really was to uh, take a step backwards and we've all heard of uh, the impacts of things such as you know Brazilian rainforests or what have you but it's more than the impacts upon the locality, the species, the habitats etc. Um, what the Millennium Ecosystems Assessment attempted to do was to take a scientific view of the wider impacts of these kind of actions at a local level um, not only so they could better track environmental change going forward and move to a more sustainable system of land management but also to track the impacts upon humans and they're talking about things such as well-being um, so the idea is that it's greater than the sum of the parts that just looking at these individual things within the landscape do doesn't give you the full impact um, of the sort of well, the detrimental impacts upon value, etc. So that's essentially what ecosystem services was developed to do. Um, and the study, as it was put together by the United Nations, came up with these four categories: uh, provisioning services, um, and these are the products that are obtained from ecosystems. And the examples given here are things such as food, fibre, fuel. Regulating services. And these are the benefits that are obtained from the regulation of ecosystem processes. And examples again here, such as carbon capture, air quality. There was cultural services, and these were interestingly defined as the non-material benefits that people obtain through recreation, reflection, etc. And then underpinning the other three were supporting services. Um, and these things such as nutrient cycling, oxygen production, soil formation, things that are absolutely fundamental to the delivery of everything else. Um, and the diagram here um, goes into greater detail. The important thing from a heritage perspective is that heritage was always put into cultural services. Um, and if you look at any ecosystem assessment that's been done, that's the area that has the least amount of work. Um, because, quite honestly, um, people often consider that, well, it's all esoteric, it's not really something that you can um, look at scientifically, it's about what people feel, how they experience, etc. So quite often it's been put on the, the too difficult pile. So any ecosystem ass assessments that have been done, you will see only marginal, marginal coverage for cultural services, and of course that impacts upon the, the understanding of heritage within the mix there. Um, and that uh, particular challenge has been um, put into sharp focus with Brexit. You might not have heard of that, but um, uh, the UK is going to be leaving the European Union um, in 2019. Um, and as part and parcel of that, um, our government um, in Westminster has issued the 25-year environment plan. So this is a vision for the environment um, over the next two and a half decades. Um, and an also an agriculture bill. So this is the domestic successor to the common agricultural policy. And as part and parcel of those two policy announcements, if you like, um, they've said that in the future, support um, will be underpinned by public environmental goods and services. So whereas the common agricultural policy um, pays farmers for having uh, an active holding um, and also pays money through the Rural Development Programme, um, to, to mitigate the environmental impacts of, of their activities. In the future, within the UK, the proposal is that farmers will only be paid for the provision of public environmental goods and services. Um, and the interesting thing from a policy perspective when it comes to cultural heritage is that they will be using natural capital accounting and ecosystem services um, as their sort of underpinning um, 
mechanism for deciding what's important in environmental terms, what are the key public environmental goods and services that will be rewarded. And this is a statement from the 25-year plan. Initiatives to protect and improve our natural world and cultural heritage are acts of stewardship by which we discharge our debt to it, and so are moral imperatives in themselves, but they're also economically sensible. In the past, our failure to understand the full value of the benefits offered by the environment and cultural heritage has seen us make poor choices. We can change that by using a natural capital approach. Um, so it's great to see that cultural heritage is recognised alongside the environment. Though I guess, like me, you all think that cultural heritage is a key part of the environment. But moving aside, our challenge is to make sure that if we want uh, the value of cultural heritage to be recognised in future environmental policy, we need to also make sure that it fits with the natural capital approach. What is natural capital? Well, it builds upon that UN ecosystems uh, assessment work. It uses the same kind of terminology, uh, terminology and language, um, but it's essentially the, the, the stock of renewable and non-renewable natural resources. And examples I give here, such as plants, animals, air, water, soils, minerals, upon which society depends. The whole point of the natural capital approach is that it is intended to identify the total economic value of natural capital in order to secure the stock of natural capital and to provide that sustainability, the sustainable flow of benefits. So it's not just saying these are the assets, it's uh, an opportunity to model the flow of stocks to and from them, to map environmental change. Um, but one of the key problems for me, I think in practical terms, is that it's natural capital. Um, and cultural heritage, the fit between cultural heritage and the natural capital approach, um, is not or hasn't been easily demonstrated so far. I won't go into great detail, this is a chart that was released alongside our 25 year environment plan um, and it shows how it will work in the future. Um, as I say, I won't go into detail, the presentation will be available afterwards, but you can see that it is about modelling the flow of stocks. It's not just about saying we've got so many historical or natural assets, it's about looking at change, how they're affected and the benefits that we either gain or lose as a result of those changes. Um, so, in view of this policy challenge to us, how do we integrate cultural heritage um, in these um, forthcoming sort of uh, policy mechanisms? Uh, Historic England um, and Natural England, the, so the, the, the key sort of um, heritage and environmental bodies within, the UK, within England, commissioned a piece of work from risk and policy analysts and land use consultants earlier this year which looked at existing natural capital accounts. And they reviewed 35 of them. So these have been done either by large agencies or large companies. And these are how they attempt to look at the things that they're interested in using the natural capital accounting approach. Um, and what we wanted to do was see the extent to which cultural heritage is included in them already in natural capital accounting. Um, and if it wasn't, how it could be included in the future um, and what the obstacles to doing that might be. And the finding was, surprisingly, that the vast majority of the ecosystem services captured within existing natural capital accounting approaches were relevant to um, the historic environment. Crucially, it didn't just fit with the cultural services, it also fitted with other services under that ecosystem services model. So you don't necessarily have to put cultural heritage into a corner, the too difficult pile. You can integrate it or mainstream it into the others. Um, and just to give a very, well, no, actually, I've got a better example going forward. Um, and this is how they actually went through the process. Um, they collated existing evidence on accounting. They did rapid appraisals. They assessed how historic environment could fit into those ecosystem services and what the benefits would be. They explored the options for improving ways in which it could be integrated um, within existing ecosystem services, assessments and also natural capital accounts. They recommended priority areas for future research and they suggested ways in which the incorporation of the historic environment into natural capital accounting could be better achieved. Um, 
and this is just the sort of mechanism behind that rapid appraisal. So they were looking at the assets themselves. Uh, on the left hand side you can see natural capital, right, land use habitats. On the right hand side, historic capital. Um, so again, very similar sort of approaches to, to um, the natural environment and to cultural heritage. Once they'd established what the assets were they were interested in, they looked at the flow of services to and from them using that ecosystems model. And then they attempted to capture the final benefits in both outcomes delivered and market and non-market goods. Um, again, you'll be able to read the detail on this in the presentation subsequently. But um, the historic environment did fit surprisingly well into something which is the natural capital approach. It was found that in existing um, assessments, the 35 that were reviewed, the historic environment could be linked to the stock of natural environment. It was possible to identify and measure how historic environment influences the condition of the natural environment. It's possible to measure how change in the condition influences the magnitude of services that flow to and from the stock and a premium could be attached to the additional value and benefits that were provided by heritage. Um, but the uh, summary of it was that of the 35 assessments that they looked at, not a single one had actually included cultural heritage. Some of them had got a title there around cultural heritage with a question mark next to it. And when they unpacked the reasons why they hadn't gone down and included it, it was because they didn't think that the fit was as good as it actually was, uh, but more importantly they had no idea how to begin to include cultural heritage. What they needed were worked examples. Um, so as a next stage to that we commissioned eight uh, practical thematic geographical um, studies of cultural heritage within um, natural capital accounting and ecosystem services. Um, and you can see the uh, consultants that have been commissioned for them and you can see that they're um, either you know, an example here, dry stone walls in the Peak District National Park, um, or it could be a particular area such as the Trent Valley. So the idea is to pull out the cultural heritage from all of them with a view to us understanding how it could be integrated more widely into future assessments using natural capital accounting. Um, and we have, uh, of these eight that have been commissioned, I'll just give you a quick example which curiously is being done by a Pete's outfit. Um, and this is looking at stone walls in the Peak District National Park. And again, they're an important part of the landscape. They're iconic. But what this study is doing is looking at them through the filter of ecosystem services and natural capital accounting and see how stone walls, which are undoubtedly culturally significant, fit into that supporting, provisioning, regulating and cultural services um, sort of framework. And they've attempted to show the ways in which they deliver against each of those headings. So just because it's natural capital accounting, just because it's ecosystems, doesn't mean that cultural heritage doesn't contribute to it. Um, and the example that I was going to go back and show you earlier is regulating services. So we have a stone wall, it's historically significant, but the fact is that it can reduce flood risk or the leaching of uh, fertilizers into watercourses. So, you know, actually it is a regulating service, it's providing not just a cultural one. And that's just one example. Um, but the important thing is, for those of the, that might be interested, that these studies come to fruition in November this year, and we're holding a two-day workshop in London on the 6th and 7th of uh, November. The first day we'll be looking at the results of those eight pilot projects. The second day we'll be looking at where next. How can we use this in the future? So I'm sure that if anyone is interested to come to London on the 6th or 7th of November, uh, we can find space for you. Um, so I've just given you the, a very quick canter through uh, the, the issues. We can't ignore, uh, given the increasing weight that's accorded to, to them in policy terms, ecosystem services and natural capital <coughs> accounting, they're going to become increasingly important. And that's not just, of course, within the UK, that's within Europe more widely, particularly within EU policy. We, therefore, it's imperative that we demonstrate the fit with cultural heritage. Um, but one of the things that we've uh, discovered is that, you know, the fit with cultural heritage within these existing approaches might be 75%, something like that. What about cultural heritage that is important, that doesn't fit? 
within those models. And that's why we currently, uh, with the Department for the Environment, Food, Rural Affairs, and the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, beginning the very preliminary stages of looking at something we call cultural capital. It uses the methodology, um, it's identical methodology to natural capital accounting, but it's specifically for cultural heritage. Because if we can't demonstrate that this 25% of heritage doesn't fit into the natural capital accounting approach, then therefore doesn't that mean it has no value at all? And that's why we have to have a parallel model as well. And as I say, it's a question mark because it's early days, but we like to think of it as cultural capital. So thank you very much. <laughs>